Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, hope you are all keeping safe and well. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jill Murphy, and I head up the BPFI banking um, BPFI payments pillar, which comprises membership from across the ecosystem um, to include domestic international banks, card providers, community banking, and increasingly online only players. Um, if you could humor me for a few moments before we look forward to the future payments, um, I want to take you back um, so we can take stock, take a little time to take stock of the evolution in payments um, over the last number of years. Next slide, please. Super. Okay, so when we look back, three milestones come together and come to my mind. First one being PSD2. Um, payments emerged as a, a policy focus back in 2007, uh, or with the PSD1, I beg your pardon, PSD2 is ingrained in my mind. So PSD1 paved the path for the establishment of, of the single European payments area um, and created standardised rules for, for credit transfers, direct debit card payments. Um, you know, it's long since forgotten by many of us who, who moved on um, to, to where we are today. Followed then, if we jump forward to June 2011, and the Department of Finance here asked the Central Bank of Ireland to take a lead role creating the uh, National Payments Plan, the MPP, which many of us will remember with joy. Um, this is where industry representatives work together to develop a number of initiatives that would enhance um, Ireland's competitiveness effectively. Um, main objectives to promote and drive and uplift in, in the use of secure and efficient electronic payment methods, enable new innovation in payments and migrate all of our electronic credit transfer and direct debits to SEPA. So essentially shut down our legacy systems and become true, true Europeans. Um, the objectives of the MPP largely largely achieved, but obviously some work remains. And with the, the, the pace of the payments industry, we shall never close the book on it. Um, it is worth noting, I suppose, whilst we did see an extraordinary uplift in digital, the use of digital channels and, and a migration to online, there's still a place in society for cash and checks um, for, for cons Irish consumers and businesses. We then leap forward to PSD2 um, in 2018. We all know the objectives of this, enhanced security, fraud prevention, foster innovation, level playing field, et cetera, et cetera. Um, two key components really, um, strong customer authentication, SCA, and um, it's fair to say across the industry, our love affair with SCA continues as we um, march towards the, the delivery of SCA for e-commerce um, in December of this year. COVID-19 had a, an extremely significant detrimental impact to the ecosystem's ability to deliver um, to that deadline. And um, rest assured, we did lobby very, very hard to try and get, seek a further extension for that reason. Um, however, it wasn't forthcoming. So we need to, to move on and do what we can um, for, for the deadline. The other element, PSD2, obviously, is open banking. And we now have um, the, the implementation of APIs have supported the emergence of big techs and innovative fintech players into financial services. Um, API usage in Ireland has been muted thus far. Um, however, in, in recent weeks, we've seen a significant uplift in AISP activity, which is, which is great to see. Um, I think if we were to speak to some actors in, in the open banking space, the jury may still be out as to whether the APIs, as currently legislated, meet expectations, but um, only time will tell. Has PST two met its objectives in Ireland and Europe? I think, again, too early. Um, ultimately, customers will decide and adoption is key for, for, for new products and new channels. Next slide, please. Thanks. So just over there on the right, you can see the journey we've been on since 2011 to 2019. Electro ele electronic payments up 165%, checks down 63%. So a significant change. Um, cash relatively flat, it's fair to say. Um, so 2020, um, um, we, we move into a new decade and unfortunately we get hit with um, COVID-19. 
and COVID-19 has presented huge, enormous challenge for all of us, both mentally, physically, emotionally, um, and let's not forget Hergate, which clearly I have yet to resolve. Um, but the payments industry really has stood tall and proud throughout um, and worked very quickly at the outset to retain continuity of service and operations and provide security and assurance for customers. I mean, in, in my opinion, what we have seen is a resilient industry supported by resilient people, you know, who look quickly to the problem and immediately ask themselves, how do we solve this? How do we move forward? Ways of working changed overnight. Um, essentially, we had measures introduced immediately, redistribution of staff, segregation of key services, um, the rollout of remote um, working capability for applications and payment systems that we never would have considered or thought possible heretofore. So, um, and, and we have a migration of, of, of people onto online, therefore resilience is key. Um, so a, a good start. We then coupled that with, okay, what can we do for the customer here? How can we help the customer? How can the industry help? And with customers at the forefront of their mind and building on this new norm way of working, um, you know, the, one of the first actual tangible changes that was made, and I remember it well, it was on the 13th of March in this very building here, um, the industry made the decision to roll out an increase to the contactless limit of um, from 30 to 50. It may seem small in some people's minds, but in actual fact, um, that move was so well received by government, retailers, consumers alike. Um, so a, a, a great move, and we were the first to, to move across Europe. We also see uh, virtual point of sale terminals being issued out and mobile card readers so home deliveries could still continue. The likes of doctor surgeries or chemists could take online and phone orders. Um, access to cash, whilst um, you know, demand dipped significantly, um, it was maintained. All our ATMs were available um, and, and branches were open for those who wished to visit them. Next slide, please. So what has COVID done from a consumer perspective? It has changed consumer behavior. It has changed our habits. It's accelerated our use of, of digital channels. channels. Um, people are shopping online and using cards now that never would have done so before. Unfortunately, my own mum isn't one of them um, and she didn't take to the online shopping. So I queued at Tesco's every Saturday for her, but um, so many people did. Um, we, you know, enforced cocooning for, for a lot of people and particularly the, the older generation. I think people realized that they can self-serve, um, they can find their goods and pur pur purchases online. And, you know, as a result, footfall fell by 50% or greater, um, you know, almost overnight. We also saw an immediate drop in the demand for cash, 60% checks very similar. We see contactless vying for world domination and 92% of all adults are using contactless now. The month of May, um, we had 600 million transactions or 19.3 19 million per day transactions in contactless alone. And the average transaction value spiked from 1251 to 1530. It may not seem huge, but it's a big jump in terms of the, the volume of payments and transactions going through. <laughs> We see a whopping 41% of the population now shopping online, and we 43% of people using their smartphones at point of sale when they when they 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 do their shopping. So they say it takes 21 days to form a habit. Um, undoubtedly, we're well past that. So has consumer ch behavior changed? I believe it has. I think a lot of it will be sticky into the future. Um, and certainly it has accelerated, the, these last few months have accelerated the already fast-paced migration to digital and electronic payments. It's now up to us to continue that journey and leverage from that experience. Next slide, please. So if we look to the future then and, and look out to the EU institutions and, and what they're saying and, and you know what, what the next strategic move will be, um, it's undisputed that payments will play an integral, strategic and critical role in the future development of, of the European and Irish economies and the single market. Um, 
it's become apparent for me at the EU that whilst payments heretofore may have been seen as a an operational you know necessity um it's it's acknowledged now and it's clear that payments play a key political component to the future success of the EU it's intended that payments the future landscape will be driven by digitalization across a wide range of sectors um, and there's a strong desire to ensure Europe's independence in the field of payments the Commission has recently published a retail payments consultation, um, which will feed into the publication of their own strategy and their own vision, Q3, Q4 of this year. Um, perhaps coincidentally or, or not, um, in recent days, we saw the launch of the European Payments Initiative, EPI, both indicators that clear direction um, and change is imminent. And the ambition of e EPI is vast, um, you know, to create a fully interoperable pan-European solution, you know, offerings to include cards, um, European card, um, um, you know, um, P2P, digital wallet, you know, the, really essentially EPI wants to create a new standard for European consumers and merchants for all payment channels um, into the future. And you know, the vision thereon, assuming we can deliver that and do deliver that, the challenge will then to be glo to globalize these offerings. Um, you know, can Europe set the global standard in the world of payments? All eyes are already on us with PSD2 implementation. Um, so, you know, go big or go home, as they say. But um, in my opinion, EPI ambitious, most definitely very ambitious. Um, doable, perhaps, maybe, um, it will take a number of years um, therefore, we we shouldn't wait for it. Um, is it necessary? Questionable. Um, is this what consumers need or want? Um, again, time will tell that one. Next slide, please. So what will secure Europe and Ireland's future success in payments, I think, in, in my opinion, is made up of a few, of a few components. Um, first and foremost, consumer demand. You know, future developments, innovation, have to be consumer-led in order to retain market share and challenge uh, the growing competition in the market. What do consumers want? They want speed, convenience, security, and I include myself in this. We're all consumers. We want to feel secure. We want to be in charge of our own data. Um, and we want choice. We want to be able to make choices. Um, next component is regulation. And you know, regulation can often pose challenges and more often than not probably does um, but within that we can often find opportunities um, PSD2 is an excellent example of how a regulatory mandate to provide open access to payment and um, payment and accounts data has enabled and encouraged the industry to innovate and develop beyond perhaps what we previously would have thought possible and I know many will say Stop. We have enough regulation, um, and, and I don't disagree. However, further regulatory mandates may be forthcoming, um, perhaps in the area of open finance. Will we see a, a mandate for instant payments if it doesn't move at the pace um, that, that the, the EU institutions expect and want it to move at? Um, so we will see mandates. We will see regulation. But I suppose in, it's up to us to strive. To, to seek the competitive edge in that regulation and not only bury ourselves in the challenge of you know the change and and the burden of implementation however um we absolutely need a break the more we need to step back the bedrock is there let us now evolve and um be led as i say by the consumer we also need to find a place for the coexistence of electronic and, and paper such as cash and um, less so checks um, but despite the continuous growth in, in digital solutions, the demand is still there for cash at a much lessened um, level, um, you know, which I suppose puts the challenge to us. As we need to, to retain access to cash, we need to think, are there smarter ways for us to work? Um, you know, do we, is there collaboration opportunities here that can take the burden of supporting that cash cycle um, you know, and lessen it across the industry? Um, and we also need to be cognizant of, of those less digi savvy um, solutions. There's a, a customer base out there that wants to retain access to these products. So there has to be a place for coexistence. Data. 
data, a small word, four letters, um, but really data is the new oil, um, it, that's no secret. Any future expansion in this space has to provide for equal access on the basis of same activities, same rules, uh, to ensure a true level playing field and competition across the EU. Any use of such data needs to be open, ethical um, and in line with the regulatory obligations under GDPR. And finally, underpinning everything is, is cybersecurity. We have to keep our businesses, our customers safe and secure. Any breach can not only lead to potential for financial, reputational, you know, data protection concerns, um, but essentially it breaks the circle of trust that the industry has with their customers and has, has worked so hard to, 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 to retain. Final slide, please. So, what do I think? I think the future is bright. Um, I think it's brilliant. Um, I also think it's very fast paced um, and is going to be competitive. Um, you know, we have the bedrock in PSD2 and instant payments. We now need the market to, to lead us and, and to allow us, afford us the time to deliver the innovation that, that the, the, the market wants and needs. Um, we mustn't forget that Ireland provides fantastic opportunities. You know, it is a great launch pad. We have access to superb talent um, and we have a, an experience and we have a proven track record in the success of with so many indigenous Irish companies. Um, the forthcoming commission strategy, um, I believe, will determine the road we travel. Um, but it is the financial services ecosystem, you know, the current incumbents and the challenges alike, including trade associations such as ourselves and BPFI, that can drive and facilitate cross-industry collaboration and determine how fast we travel that road. Um, there's one thing that's certainly certain, um, it'll be a, a, one hell of a ride with um, some bumps and some sharp bends along the way, um, but exciting times ahead. So, thank you. Hi all, thanks Jill for, for, for that intro speech, I um, thought, thought it was very enlightening. Um, as you're probably aware, I'm not actually Sean Smith, so I think Sean has some tef technical difficulties joining. So if I could, uh, if it's possible, to introduce the, the, the panel um, to discuss uh, the, Jill's, Jill's presentation. So Jill is remaining on the panel. We also have ha Sam Hinton-Smith from Stripe, and uh, we have Gary Conroy who's Chief Product Officer from Transformate, and myself, Director in the Payments Consulting Practice in Deloitte. Um, so if I can start, um, I think Jill, you know, from your presentation, the industry itself is fast moving, has been accelerated further by COVID. How much do you, of this do you believe has changed for good? And what are the key enablers the sector needs to support this change? And I suppose added to that, what have we learned most about the resilience of the sector? post-COVID. So if I could start maybe with you, Gary, um, your, your thoughts on those? Yeah, I think Jill touched on yeah. a few things there, just around a, a lot of companies, the initial part of grappling with COVID was around just, you know, the, the remote challenges, uh, you know, that all companies would have uh, in, in uh, not having access to the office. But I think, you know, continuity across the board was really retained, uh, you know, very well from an, from an operational perspective. And um, so then I think what companies are doing is pivoting towards their, you know, how do they get through this? How do they need to pivot? What do they need to change? Uh, and I think for, you know, for a lot of companies, that's really about, you know, access to, to liquidity uh, and making sure that they keep a tight eye uh, on the cash flow and the balance sheet. Um, so while we're talking about future of payments, uh, I think there's certainly an opportunity around the digitization of processes and companies like ourselves and Transformate that you know um, enable companies to process their payments in a digitized or online and integrated fashion, integrated with their ERP, integrated with their accounts payable system. We've seen a lot of those projects accelerated. Um, so that's been, I think that's been an opportunity. It hasn't hit all areas of the economy equally. So likewise within Transformate, we have a, a international student business. And uh, as you would have seen, I don't know the news in the States there recently where there's 1 million overseas students 
that are potentially uh, going to be asked to leave. Uh, international student business has transformed uh, and everything's moved online. So, you know, within that, you know, we've actually had a pivot in terms of from accepting uh, payments from international students to actually really easing the process for universities and higher level um, institutions to be able to process refunds and to get money back to those students that, uh, in an efficient, seamless way. So you've got to figure out how it affects your business in particular, because everyone's a little bit different. Uh, and then I suppose the one thing that a lot of businesses have been looking at from a survival perspective, if you look at the uh, Department of Business and uh, Enterprise and Innovation, the DBEI, there's, they have um, a website that is pretty up to date that tells you what the take up has been and the various different supports for businesses that are out there. So there's a lot of smaller schemes, but in particular, you see the take up of the working capital scheme and then the, the, the restart grant more recently. So the restart grants between like two and 10,000 and there's been, I think 37,000 applications as of a few days ago and 22,000 approved. I think when you ask some of the challenges, the specific challenge for a lot of businesses is going to be making sure that they have the working capital uh, in place. So some of the challenges in getting that money to the businesses in the, in the right way and quickly. So, you know, I was taking a look at that site this morning, DBI, and there's been 3,000 applications in the working capital scheme, but only 632 loans granted. So we need to make sure that we keep this economy going while it's in, you know, effectively, uh, you know, an, an induced coma. Uh, and, you know, we'll see the volume shift in the interim, and hopefully we'll see a return to, you know, a lot of the offline uh, activities start to pick up as we as we then open up and volumes return to something, you know, that we'd see approaching normal. I think we still have trouble connecting with Sean and Sam. Your your reflections on, you know, the post COVID environment and you know what, what it means for the industry. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Matt. Um, so so. Uh, before I answer that, for those that, that don't know, Stripe is a, a technology company that builds economic in infrastructure for the internet. So we we help organisations ranging from startups to uh, to established household names to, to accept payments and to and to manage their, their business online. Um, and so that means that we have a, a particular vantage point over the over the online economy. And I think you know what we've seen over uh, what we've seen through through the COVID economy is that years of migration from offline to online have been have been compressed into a matter of months and that has meant that businesses of all kinds have had to move to a to an online first model um, very very quickly so so for example in Ireland we've seen more than 3000 businesses spin up online on on Stripe um, since the beginning of March so so effectively uh, since since the start of the, the pandemic many of those are uh, will be traditional small and medium-sized enterprises that uh, in January of this year would would probably never have even thought about um, having an online presence. So, so for example, one of those is um, Flying Elephant Productions, which uh, which was a uh, is, is a company that produces produces fit out fit outs for, for exhibitions and events that obviously aren't happening now. They pivoted very quickly to producing uh, work from home desks, um, in, including the one that I'm that I'm, I'm speaking from now. So I, you know I think the um, the, the the outlook is that whilst we all hope that things will return to normal um, as quickly as possible, I, I think the re the reality, um, as Jill was saying, is that the economy has changed permanently in in a number of ways, and I think for us in in the payment sector, that means that there's there's even more of an obligation on us um, to ensure um, that we're uh, that we're resilient, that we're reliable, and that we're serving merchants and ultimately consumers and just to, to pick up on that point um i suppose we can't have this webinar without mentioning wirecard i mean i suppose for both you gary and sam you know your reflections on you know the wirecard and the impact it, ha it might have in, in terms of confidence and how regulators may potentially respond maybe gary first yeah and um 
I saw a LinkedIn post there just today around the Wirecard it appears to be the, the the bad news that just keeps on giving around. There was a number of shell companies that were set up by employees all around the UK that were involved uh, in pornography and gambling and other transactions. So, it, you know, you, you would have to, while there have been questions for a number of years, I think when you look at you know the audit and the uh, the regulation. You, you, you'd have to wonder how it's taken this long to actually uh, uncover a lot of what's been going on. But I, I do think, though, that what you, you know, firstly, there's there's a trend towards you know banking and indeed payments as a service, uh, and that trend isn't going to go away because of Wirecard. So you know we have the likes of Clearbank, Rails Bank. You know, and even in Ireland, PFS recently a super acquisition by EML that provides services to other uh, fintech companies. And there's a regulatory driver behind this as well uh, in terms of you know PSD2 and, and open APIs. Um, uh, and that's been a continuing journey, you know, from the first you know PSD1 that Jill mentioned. Uh, you know, which gave a legal framework to non-bank financial institutions, uh, PSD2, then opening up the different services. Um, <clears throat> and it's not a trend that's going to be stopped. And actually, we should be a little bit encouraged by how agile some of the fintech community has been. So some of the fintech firms that were using the likes of Wirecard, so Curve, for example, over the course of a couple of days since the, the Friday that Wirecard had um, all of the money frozen by the, the FCA and the, the regulators, they changed not only their issuing because they had actually already been a principal member of MasterCard, so they you know pivoted to doing their issuing, but they also then had to change their acquiring as well uh, and move everything to, to checkout.com. So, you know, Again, I think there's other from an Irish context. I'm not quite sure where on Post is now. I think they they were their currency card was also using Wirecard, and they'd they'd frozen that. Um, but you can really see that in the matter of a few days a week, that you know tech driven companies can you know pivot and and deal with these uh, type of um, type of occurrences. And of course, the customer's money is is frozen and is segregated and is is safeguarded. It's just the activities of the uh, uh, of the firm that's you know providing those services that were in question. And I think it probably leads into Jill. You mentioned in the the presentation whether open banking has kind of been successful. It's a trend that's not going to stop. The one thing I'd call out. Again, Open Banking UK has stats that are updated on a monthly basis and is looking at the May stats. There are 410 million uh, open banking API calls that happened in May. Uh, but if you talk about the future of payments, 409 million of those were account information calls. Less than 1 million were actually payment initiation calls. So when when you look at what the next phase is, I really think it's got to be around having those third parties uh, doing the payment initiation, which is exactly the kind of thing that, of course, you layer on top of the EPI initiative that sits on top of instant payments. So uh, banking and payments as a service isn't going to go away. There'll be more players providing solutions. There's more regulators that have innovation and competition within their mandate. And I think it's a question of, uh, where that's going to go. There's already a lot of aggregators, in, even in Ireland, uh, Revolut actually launched uh, a few weeks ago their account aggregation service. But uh, you know, I'd like to see a lot more on that payment initiation side. And certainly from Transformate's perspective, really something that we'd be taking advantage of to provide uh, you know, an even more seamless experience to, to our own customers. Um, and Jill, are you in on that? Yes. Yeah, I suppose two two comments. I suppose if I could firstly just um, jump back to to Sam's points. Um, we have a, well, I suppose where do we go from here from an Ireland perspective? You know, and how do we how do we 
jump ourselves out of COVID-19. We have a new government now, we, and in their program for government, we have a commitment to reboot this economy. We also have an acknowledgement of the dependency on the financial services industry to do that. So I suppose we have a good window of opportunity now to influence and drive here and, and you know, and need to, to take part in those active part in those discussions as, as they move forward. But Sam, you mentioned those 3,000, um, 3, I think, uh, new merchants have gone online and they popped up. They were never online before. Um, a fantastic and, and, and needed and, and may there be many more of them. However, I, I do worry about the implementation of strong customer authentication for those merchants because, you know, they popped up very quickly. Um, you know, will the implementation of SCA um, later this year um, impact them? Will they be able to cope with it? Are they prepared for it? So I think it's incumbent on on the 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 you know the the acquirers and the ecosystem and the market and the schemes and the the payment service gate you know, payment payment gateway providers to make sure that those merchants can still trade come January one and that their transactions don't get declined. So there's a huge journey I think it mentioned to climb to ensure we we support those those new online providers. From a PIS perspective, maybe to to your point, Gary. Um, yeah, absolutely. Little to no traffic in, in PISP, um, but there's a large element of customer adoption, customer trust, customer awareness. Um, you know that that needs to go into to that journey as well, and that effort before I think we'll see any any future significant uplift. Um, but certainly something to go for. I would agree. Bring you in on that, Sam. I mean, the, the challenge for those merchants, you know, um, they've adopted e-commerce at pace, but is is there a an issue coming? I mean, look, I, I think we we have to we have to go back to the to the start of SCA. You know, it has very laudable objectives, which is to protect consumers from from authentication fraud, and and that's that's something that we should we should welcome, we should support. Um, but you know, payments are uh, fundamentally. Um, getting more complex to navigate, uh, and an SCA SCA is only going to only going to accelerate that that trend. Um, uh, and you know that's one of the reasons that we we've always been kind of laser focused on on abstracting that complexity away away for users. Um, I think that I, I think Jill to, to your point, uh, I, I suspect that you know all online businesses, whether large or small, are going to be impacted by SCA. Um, in some form, um, but but in in the short term, I, I think that 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 complexity associated with with SCA could disproportionately impact um, uh, smaller businesses and and reinforce incumbents, and and that's something that I don't, I don't think any of us should uh, should be prepared to to accept. Um, and and that that's where you know I think that technology has a has an important role to play. In ensuring that that we can that we can see the benefits of SCA in reducing fraud fraud rates, but we can try to um, we, we can we can look to minimise or even um, to remove altogether uh, the frictions that that could be that could be associated um, with with the introduction of, of SCA. So that, so that's why um, at Stripe we've we've invested in a in, in a new API. Uh, which is uh, which is uh, designed to enable users um, to make the most of of the SCA exemptions um, and to send transactions to to to, to 3DS2 um, when necessary. Uh, and we we also acquired a Dublin-based startup last year called TouchTech, which provides uh, technology to to issuing banks in order to in order to to smooth the authentication process. So I, I do think that that technology is 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 part of the answer. Um, but that's not in any way, shape, or form to um, uh, to, to try to um, play down the challenge that SCA presents to to merchants in Ireland, but also to across Europe. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and I think in Jill's presentation, you know, as we start to look forward into Europe, you know, two big things seem to emerge. One is Epi. Uh, I'd be interested in get the panelists' views on, you know, is Epi a game changer? Is it overly ambitious? You know. Um, get your thoughts on it. Maybe start with you, Jill, first. Um, I beg your pardon. I lost my sound, so you're going to have to ask me that question again. I'm just back in. No, no worries. Uh, 
It was on the EPI initiative, you know, and I think uh, you described it well in terms of what its overall ambition is, which is to have a pan-European uh, solution and it's to rival the existing card schemes, um, you know, and there'll be a card available, potentially a mobile payment solution, peer-to-peer, -peer, offering digital wallet, etc. So, you know, given, as you mentioned, all of the items that banks in particular need to address in terms of regulatory changes. Do you believe this is overly ambitious? Is it a game changer? Um, what, what are your initial thoughts? I think the vision is good. Um, you know, I, I can see why we would reach for the stars from, from a European perspective. Do I necessarily think that we should put our efforts into recreating a new card across Europe? you know let's would we not be better placed focusing on instant and you know the the the, the bedrock that we already have um you know it, it remains to be seen but I, the one thing i do say it will take years right this is a this is a long journey um for people to travel and and for europe to travel and um i think it's important that we don't sit and wait for EPI. I think we need to continue with initiatives that are currently underway. We need to continue to listen to the market and, and drive on, but all the time in the back of our minds, thinking anything we do needs to plug and play needs to plug and play. So we need to be able to plug and play into the back end of EPI, you know, um, as and when it, it comes to pass. So that's, okay. that's my view. Gary, in terms of, of in your business, it, has Epi come up? You know, what's what's your opinion on on a pan-European solution like like the one that's been proposed? Sure. So um, yeah, as Transformate does uh, B2B cross-border payments and receivables. So we actually operate on a global basis. We're not just looking at Europe, but we're also regulated across the US, Canada, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong. So uh, it hasn't come up too much. Um, but on a previous slide, I was in the cards world uh, with the uh, Relex payments, which was subsequently bought by uh, Atlanta-based uh, global payments. So it, it's kind of, it's an interesting one. And you know, I've been in the payments for like 20 years. And it's not the first attempt to you know have an alternative to Visa and Mastercard, and there's been for you know a long while a strong political will to have a, a challenger there. And I mean, yeah, a, a lot of it has been driven around you know reducing the cost of card acceptance to merchants, which is obviously a good thing. We want more businesses to go online. We want to grow the internet economy. And we want it to be easy using technology like Stripe and Transformate for businesses to process payments. But we also don't want there to be you know, the, the cost um, prohibitive in any way. So, you know, you have seen, you know, really the whole PSD1 was to make pan-European or euro area cross-border payments the same as domestic. MasterCard were fined, you know, 570 million a couple of years ago by preventing merchants from shopping around across borders in the euro area so you know and then probably the most successful thing that happened was the capping of the multilateral interchange fee so back in 2015 we had debit and credit cards being capped at 20 and 30 basis points it means that the cost has come down to accept cards so for consumers that pay with cards to businesses do they have a problem at the moment and are you going to get them to switch uh, or get the merchants to switch to using a step instant or bank based rail. So, and it's interesting, I kind of, you know, I've worked in the consumer to business merchant acceptance side and the B2B, and it tends to be more that, you know, cards are very uh, convenient method for consumers. Um, but a lot of the bank based payments, if you look at the amount of opportunity, like there's 133 trillion cross border flow. This is McKinsey's global report. Um, or 136 trillion cross-border flow. Uh, 133 trillion of that, all but 3 trillion, is actually in B2B. And that primarily is all taking place over the bank rails uh, because it's not percentage-based. You're not paying a percentage-based charge. So there's a high ticket and high value. 
that is more suitable. So will you get a shift from card to bank rails for consumer-based payments? I mean, ideal manage it for online only within the the, the Netherlands. Um, but you know, a lot of one of the other main objectives that you can kind of see that comes out of it is to replace the national card schemes. So you know, there was what 22 European national card schemes back in 2013. There's like 10 now. They're going to disappear anyway and be you know co-branded either with Visa or co-badged with Visa or Mastercard. Mm-hmm. But you know, so I think that problem will naturally uh evolve because you know issuers will look to issue cards that can be used internationally so uh, i yeah i struggle a little bit with um you know whether you're really going to get consumers and merchants to be able to shift i understand the reason for it and it's not a not necessarily a new argument um but you know i think well it's it's a wait and see approach and certainly having alternatives uh and having choice and i think using existing infrastructure separate instant you know and and moving to real-time rails does give you a lot of advantages and uh you know if we can if we can leverage that existing infrastructure uh uh with initiatives like these and and we'll we'll see what happens with regard to adoptions uh you know this is obviously a you know bank-led initiative as well with a number of the, the founder banks so where you have the regulatory drive, where we have the industry players involved, um, I think it's a good thing and it's success. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just we'll wait and see and see what happens. Okay, and and Sam, from your point of view, you know, uh, promoting an account-to-account based solution on a pan-European scale, do you think it could be a success? Yeah, I mean, look, we're we're payment method agnostic, so what what matters to us is uh, is enabling merchants to offer um their consumers that the, the their payment method of preference um and so you know we, we we're supportive of of better more frictionless more secure more reliable payment methods um and and so you know we're excited by developments like uh, like the epi um p- particularly if they are um if they if they provide a set of rails upon which kind of innovative and bank-to-bank payment methods can, uh, can be built, uh, but uh, as, as as Jill points out, you know, a, a program like this is going to take a, a number of years to get to market. Uh, the, the other thing that I would I would point out is that um, al- although uh, we all recognise that the world of payments can be very fast moving, uh, consumer behaviour change when it comes to payments can can be very slow. Um, you know, consumers like to use payment methods that they know and that they trust. So you know, even um, you know, there are there are uh, long-standing um, traditionally paper-based payment methods like direct direct debit that are still around today and still very popular. Um, so I, I do think that there's also a point about um, c- consumer change and and how long that takes to to, to come through. I, I, th- I think the, the other point is that if one of if the objectives one is to is bind together the 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 EU digital single market, then you know it, it, again, um, there is there's a role for technology to play um, in ensuring that consumers and merchants can can use the payment method that that they prefer, kind of irrespective of where they're located or or, or who they're um, buying and selling from. Yep. Um, and I think linked to and we, we you mentioned Jill in your presentation, you know the intrinsic to Epi is up against, um, and I suppose next steps, you know, the potential for it to be to be mandated. You know, what will that do for the industry? I mean, um, you indicated that there's probably a strong desire to mandate it if they, if if there's no immediate take up, and I suppose Epi will be dependent on it. But in terms of businesses being able, or banks in particular being able to react to that, um, what, what's your thoughts? Um, I, I think a, a mandate and, you know, whilst we, it doesn't sit naturally sit well with, with, with people to, to, to have a mandate to force us, 
um, to to move forward at separate instance. I think it gives the the strength and the the, the power to the companies to get the support. Um, you know, both from an internal change perspective, a budgetary perspective. Um, you know, it is a huge program of work. Let's not underestimate this. You know, we're looking at a, a large change program, 18, 24 months, whatever, you know, what it may take. It's complex. And it's at a time where we have conflicting priorities. We have target two consolidation. We have cross -border, swift cross-border migration. Um, we have PSD2 still to complete out. You know, so therefore, with all of those conflicting priorities, it's hard to see without the mandate how we can give it the, the, the attention and the drive it needs. But um, any such mandate needs to be cognizant of the extent of the change program that 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 we're facing into, you know, so it, it's not a flick of a switch. It's not, hey, January 1, 2022, let's all be set instant. Um, you know, it needs to be, any mandate needs to be cognizant of that. Um, so at this point in time, given the priorities, I, you know, I think it would be welcomed, providing it, it gives that lead time. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jill. Um, I suppose the one of the things that's fallen off the radar as a result of COVID has been Brexit. Um, but again, it's it's fast looming again, another another cliff edge, um, and it's looking like a, a very basic free trade agreement. Um, do you think the payments industry is ready for Brexit? We start with with Sam this time. Are, are there issues still there that that need to be resolved or? Who's ever ready for Brexit? <laughs> that's a that's a fair point, Jill. Look, I, I mean, I, I think I think if if we if we take a step back, there are there are going to be uh, there are going to be many small and not so small edge cases um, that that will need to be resolved between between now and and the and the end of this year. Um, you know, and and it's worth flagging that. Uh, the, the the likes of BPFI have been tireless in you know in searching for clarity from uh, from authorities at, at EU and national level um, on on a great many of those issues. I think for you know for for, for Stripe as a business and and I'm sure for for many of our users operating across Europe, we uh, you know, thirst for long term clarity um, on on how, how this is going to going to work in practice. Um, but but you know the reality is that while we don't have that right now, um, we uh, you know we, we we can be sufficiently nimble and to work to work around it. And you know a, a great many financial institutions have um, you know have done what they have what they need to do uh, at a structural level to ensure that they're as, as ready as or as ready as possible for Brexit. And Jill, do you want to let you come in on that? So, yeah, the B word. Um, you know, we are operating, I suppose, a, a couple of, of, you know, streams across BPFI. Obviously, we have our own task force, but at a pure payments level, um, the, the one thing that pops to mind is is the funds transfer regulation. We're operating on the basis that the the UK will will be non EEA come first of January, and that's what, that's how we have to move forward, right? And have been for quite some time. So, you know, we have you know increased information requirements and obligations under the funds transfer regulation that if we didn't take action would result in a significant nearly nigh on all of our direct debit uh, flow between the UK and Ireland being being rejected on January one, right? Um, so that's something we started to and and a substantial volume of credit transfers as well so last year we started a program of work um to to engage with the uk market the uk psps to remediate that that position and we have made significant progress and as sam said still a piece, still a way to go um but we are working hard to ensure that there is no disruption to to that type of traffic um the other thing that pops to mind you know in, in in light in today is, is strong customer authentication. Is the UK uh, treated simply as a, a one leg out come the 1st of January 2021? You know, um, if so, is if you know, if that's the answer, if, if so, does that have any un unintended consequences for, you know, the Irish the Irish market and the Irish acquiring market? Possibly it does. Um, you know, if it's not, if we don't treat them as one leg out, we then have this fragmentation between our go live, which is January 1, and the UK. For, uh, implications 
implementation rollout of, of September. So I think there's still another a number of complexities to work through, but um, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, minimising disruption is at the forefront of, of all those discussions and, and, and working groups. And Gary, um, similarly on Brexit and you know regulation in generally, um, like how how are in, how are groups like yourselves responding to those regulatory obligations? I mean, is it a significant overhead or? Yeah, and and I think everything that we've needed to do, we've all, already done some time ago from our own perspective in terms of being licensed, uh, you know, both in the the UK and you know, uh, across Europe. And then from our legal structure perspective, we obviously we had a plan in place in order to make sure that our structures and the ownership of all of our accounts, you know, is all Brexit ready. So, you know, from our perspective, it, it was, you know, work that we had uh, underway and had, you know, due to complete beforehand. Uh, so the fact that it's still uh, ongoing, uh, I think we would, you know, we'd hope to be to be ready for it when it comes. But I think, yeah, definitely a question of be careful what you what you wish for. I think everyone was sick of talking about Brexit before, and now they get to talk about COVID and other things. So uh, yeah. just kind of wait and see what's next. Um, and I suppose to to try and wrap up. I mean, and looking from all of you, I mean. There seems to be a huge amount of innovation coming in the payments industry, a lot of challenges um, and a lot of opportunities, I suppose. What's, what's your reflections? You know, what are the big opportunities for the industry as a whole and for your own particular industry? Uh, maybe Sam, if we start with you first. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. So, I mean, th th thinking about, I mean, th thinking about so some of the challenges, um, I, I think that th so despite the, diversity that exists in the payments landscape, huge diversity, um, innovation can still often um, be, be hampered by, by silos, whether those are, are digital, financial or, or, or technological. Um, and that's sort of particularly true where, um, uh, where you know, for example, financial or, or platform infrastructure is controlled by, by a, a few incumbent providers, whether that, whether they're financial or technological. So, so we think it's incredibly important, for example, in the payment space, uh, that payment providers have open and uh, open and equal and non-discriminatory access to payment methods and to platform infrastructure and to, and to technical services in the payment space as well. I guess the other potential challenge for us is that you know we think that the free flow of data across borders is pretty fundamental to a modern um, tech-forward economy. Uh, and we'd certainly be concerned if uh, if uh, Europe were were to move closer towards um, data localization that we see that we see in other parts of the world. I, I think on the opportunities front, um, you know, when we when we look at the online economy, it's still in its infancy. Uh, only three percent of uh, of global GDP uh, is on the internet today. Um, so we see huge potential for for, for all kinds of businesses. Um, I think you know it's uh, it's it's also worth saying that the, the the internet economy today is is dominated by uh, a few advertising and, and, and e advertising giants and e-commerce platforms, and we see we see an opportunity to create a much more diversified um, internet economy that enables a whole range of uh, of smaller players to to access uh, to, to access um, markets globally. And Gary, in terms of challenges and opportunities ahead, uh, given what we've discussed? Yeah, and, uh, we've mentioned uh, you know, the, the accelerating process of, of digitization and uh, you know, the opportunities that that brings and the speed that which technology moves. I mean, you know, we talk about COVID accelerating that. I think we're... Uh, Sure, if we've gone over a million downloads now for the contact tracing app. So, shout out to Nearform based down in in Tremor, who uh, you know rolled out that solution in record time, and to have that sort of adoption uh, is 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 really impressive. Um, so, I you know I don't think you know that the pace of technology change is going to let up anytime soon. You know where I see the opportunities in the underutilized areas. We we mentioned the that you know of those uh you know 100 and 
40 million or so of the, uh, or 410 million of the API calls happening monthly, less than a million were in the payments initiation. I think for initiatives like the EPI to succeed, you need to have technology players that are going to, you know, utilize the existing infrastructure, sit on top of it and provide that technology innovation. So I can see that payments initiation is a, a big uh, area of opportunity, uh, as I'd see it. Uh, and, and, you know, then our own business in terms of Transformate, you know, um, Whereas mentioning you know globally the the amount of flow that happens that is B two B, ninety five percent of that flow is happening through the Swift and correspondent banking network, and you know the model that we use with a global network of of local accounts to transfer money, so money to consumers would be familiar with that with the likes of of, of Transferwise and you know Revolut as well, you know we provide that for businesses I think that's going to be a huge disruption, the disruption of the correspondent banking uh, model globally to be able to uh, move funds across borders around the world. Uh, and it's an, an enormous market uh, going, the, the, the McKinsey report in terms of the revenues associated with those flows that I mentioned earlier, over the next two to three years, that's gonna go from two trillion to three trillion dollars worth of revenue opportunity for companies to be able to capture. So I, I think there's enormous markets with mega trends that are happening behind them. And, you know, in, in Ireland, we have the talent to be able to address it. We have very strong, you know, payments companies that have grown up here from Transformate, to Fexco, Fintrax, PFS, and EML. You know, we have, I don't know if we like to call it Stripe FDI, Foreign Direct Investment. I know they're Irish founded by Irish brothers, but they, they founded it in San Fran, right? So, but on the on the card side, we have you know Stripe, uh, you know Elevon, you know uh, Pfizer, all these great companies, and of course Super Innovation Labs, with the likes of Mastercard, R and D Labs, that are despite the current environment, continuing to invest in thousands of jobs, and uh, you know City as well, doing a, a great job in, in Dublin. So we've got a good spread of people who are really experienced on a global basis across all areas of payments in Dublin and in the regions. And, you know, there's huge global opportunities to take advantage of those uh, megatrends. So I think we're, you know, we're well placed to, uh, to, to do so. Um, and before I conclude, I think Jill, you know, I think that the role of BPFI and particularly coordinating the banks to move from up to the upper limit of 50 was, was very impressive. Um, what what are your what's your sense of challenges and opportunities ahead? You know, I suppose opportunities that excite that you see will be exciting in the industry, but also I know you've mentioned some of the key challenges, but for you, what are the main main ones? Yeah, I mean the the guys have covered a lot of it already. Um I think you know, from a from a challenge perspective, you know, it's the pace of change, it's that that acceleration. Um, you know, also the 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 the, the challengers that are uh, that are coming into the market and the ability to, you know, with to move at pace um in, in institutions that have, you know, owned you know, legacy infrastructure infrastructure. I think the opportunities um really um the, the key opportunity is in collaboration, you know, and we have a number of work streams that are already underway across the industry, um, you know, where the, the, the banks are looking to see can they, they, they work together and pull together. Um, and that is certainly a step change in the industry. But I think we need to look broader than that. And to Gary's point, we need to look out outside of the banks as well and look to those fintech companies and, and look to a, a broader level type collaboration. Um, I also think that one of the key opportunities for the market is there is still, a, there remains a place for the standard current account, you know, and that, and that service offering and all that comes with a current account model um, from, you know, the traditional banking type system. And, um, you know, that, that is something we shouldn't lose sight of. There's absolutely a place for that in the future. And how do we find the balance between that and all of this, this, this innovation, both a challenge and an opportunity? Okay, uh, thanks for that. I think we've just come past the hour, so I'd like to leave it there for today. I would like to thank in particular Jill Murphy, Head of Payment Schemes, BPFI, for the keynote. Our panelists, Gary Conroy from Transformation, and Sam Hilton smith from Stripe, for your insights today. Um, again, I'd like to apologise for the difficulties with Sean Smith, our original moderator, in trying to connect. 
Um, and I hope you can join us next week for the final webinar in the series, this time on the future in banking environment next Wednesday at 1pm. So thank you again for your time um, and look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.